in to another episode of the Future Sox Roundup. My name is Mike Rankin. I'm your host alongside Elijah Evans. Welcome back, Elijah. It's great to have you. Today, we're talking about the standout players of the 2022 draft class because here at Future Sox, we're big fans of the way Mike Shirley is loading up the farm system through the draft. And in 2022, a number of players had a lot of success throughout the minor league system. So we're going to kind of go in depth about specific players and then maybe preview some of those who we believe are close to call-ups to the big league level. Now, close is relative. We understand that. But for 2022 draft picks, the number of names that we have here that we're celebrating, it's pretty exciting because the Chicago White Sox don't give us a lot to celebrate about lately. And we'll get into that shortly. First, I want to plug our Patreon. Go to futuresox.com and support us through Patreon. It really does fuel what we do on a day-to-day basis. Myself and James Fox record podcasts every Tuesday. Subscribe to the podcast. Elijah Evans works very hard in getting interviews of players, prospects. He talks to them one-on-one. Check it out every Monday and look at the logs. Subscribe, comment, like, give us positive feedback. It really does help us out in the algorithm and it gets us to more ears. And you, the Future Sox listener, we appreciate you. That's why we do it every single day. So I'd like to welcome in Elijah Evans because today we heard some news. Uh, some rumors going around early hot stove season. I mean, it's not even simmering yet. It's very, very premature. We're looking forward to the GM meetings. It'll be Chris Getz's first experience at the GM meetings. But we're hearing some things and stuff. According to Bruce Levine, the White Sox are interested in pursuing Whit Merrifield and Sal Perez. Um, How does that make you feel, Elijah? Just knee-jerk reaction after you saw the headlines related to the rumor. Well, it looks like we are going to be watching the 2018 Kansas City Royals in 2024. You know, I, it is what it is, right? I Rumors are rumors until they become a reality, and I don't like to get super caught up in them. And I know a lot of people are, are frustrated by this, and, and as am I. I mean, it's just at the end of the day, the White Sox just – it seemingly feels like they're refusing to just lean into this next era and they continue to, you know, between Pedro and Chris Getz and all these other factors. It's just, it's what is the obsession with the Royals? I just, I don't get it. I I get that the Royals, sure. They won a world series with a low payroll and a team of quality players that all just meshed to make one world series run that happens in baseball, right? That is not a formula for winning in the long term. It's just not. I mean, the Royals have been one of the worst franchises in baseball over the last 20 years. Yes, they won a World Series. I get it. They won a World Series with this modern era of heavy bullpen usage and a lot of homegrown talent and a lot of, you know, just veteran guys that do their job and play their role. That that doesn't lead to sustained success. And I, I so there's so much talk right now in, in the baseball world as a whole with the playoffs going on about how all these teams that are so good consistently still fall short in the playoffs. That's how baseball works. That's just, that's just the reality. You play 162 games. It's a long freaking season and you can, anything can happen come October, but you have to build for that long-term success. If I'm, I mean, people are bashing on the Dodgers. I, I would take that 10 times out of 10 over the White Sox. People were like, oh, I'd rather just tank and be bad than win 100 games and lose in the playoffs. No, you need to build sustained success. And the Kansas City Royals model is not sustained success. It worked one year and it hasn't worked the majority of the last, you know, 10, 20 years, right? So it's just that that doesn't work. Sal Perez, is an, it's an, he's an old catcher. He's past his prime. He has a hard time defending behind the plate. It's just, it's, it's exactly the opposite. With Merrifield, I'm a little more okay with just because the White Sox could use some versatility defensively, some contact skills. He's still past his prime. And that's what the White Sox continue to do is sign players that are past the prime of their career. But I think there's just this organizational reluctancy to just dive into the future and stop thinking about 2024. This team is not winning next year. This roster is not winning next season. And there's just no reason to be adding players just for the sake of adding players to try and make things work next year. But I mean, ultimately, it doesn't change that much. If you sign Whit Merrifield, if you sign Sal Perez, that doesn't change the timeline of the White Sox. So I don't really care. It just, from an organizational standpoint, it just doesn't make sense to keep doing this exact same process of going after players that are past their prime, that are we're trying to just keep them alive for another year or two. It, it's just, it doesn't make sense to me, Mike. I okay, so there's a lot there, and I feel it. I feel the passion. And I understand. And I'm with you. Like it doesn't matter to me if they are going out and getting a player like Sal Perez or Whit Merrifield in 2024 because 
the reality of the situation, we all understand it. 2024 is just going to be a nothing year anyway. A lot of development going on. And who cares with the money committed to the payroll in 2024? It's not like they were going to be competitive in the free agent market with top end rotation pieces anyway, right? They're not going to spend near the luxury tax. They never will. Uh, as long as Jerry Reinsdorf operates the club, you know, I expect a sub $200 million total team payroll. And if you're going out and acquiring a Sal Perez, that means you're getting 20 plus million per year for two years. And he's an older catcher. We know that not only is he older at uh, 34 years old, but his skill set is declining. And when you look at Merrifield, it looks like he's got a mutual option in Toronto. So a $500,000 buyout, he hits the market, the White Sox are going to pounce, fine. Because they do need to fill second base, and depending on what they want to do with Tim Anderson, up the middle is a question. The point, I think, that I want White Sox fans to kind of sympathize with, uh, at least this is how I feel, is that it's not necessarily adding players to compete. It's adding what's necessary to get them into a professional rhythm, because my goodness, is there a lack of professionalism in the clubhouse. Now, you don't have to know people or hear it from people who are near the clubhouse to know that this is a mess and that players need to be held accountable because unfortunately, Pedro Grafol didn't do a good job of that, especially considering there were a lot of veterans in his clubhouse at the beginning of the season prior to the deadline. And on top of that, you had uh, the young players not doing what's necessary on a day-to-day basis to be good major league ball players. And I think when it comes to modeling the franchise after Kansas city, as Elijah was alluding to, to me, I think the white Sox one did it to themselves, of course, because insular hire that hire has relationships built throughout his time in Kansas city. It it was just a, a foregone conclusion that if you're going to commit to Chris Getz, there's going to be some history there that he wants to bring in to the organization related to Kansas city. I understand it. Also, I think it is a matter of philosophy, not so much execution, because in Kansas City, boy, do they not spend, right? Small market ball club that's similar to the White Sox in the way they approach a competitive team. They want to really capitalize on first year player contracts, right? I know this isn't the NFL, but in that sense, players under contract, pre-arbitration, arbitration arbitration numbers, pre-free agency That's essentially how Kansas City wants to make their money and then fill the gaps with affordable free agent contracts. It sounds very similar to the way the White Sox operate their business outside of the fact that, my God, they're a big market ball club in Chicago that, you know, would offer so much support from their fan base. Should they just it's funny to me, too, going off on a little bit of a tangent to think about how little the White Sox care about the White Sox fans blowback to the decisions that the front offices make. It's just hilarious to me that they just don't care, right? They're going to do what they believe is the right decision. And I'm not saying Sal Perez or with Merrifield is the right decision because I, I'm curious how Elijah, they're even going to try to acquire a guy like Sal Perez with that contract and what the Royals want to get in return. Cause he's a bad player. We know that. Look, this is also something too. When Pedro Rafol got hired, the White Sox media sat down and spoke to Sal Perez and Perez gushed about his love for Pedro Grafol. And if there's some like-mindedness in the clubhouse there, finally from a respected veteran, somebody who holds the players accountable, that's not a non-respected manager in Pedro Grafol. I think that's the value you're trying to get out of it. And you're filling a position of need. We talked about it. Uh, Corey Lee is not ready to be the everyday catcher. Carlos Perez is not even ready to be a, everyday backup catcher. Um, Adam Hackenberg needs time to develop as well. The farm system is still developing Edgar Caro, who's 20, 21 years old. So there's just a lot there. Understanding that the White Sox aren't going to be competitive. However, as a White Sox fan, I totally get it. You're going after bad players to fill positions in need in a season that's already lost with already having a bad taste in your mouth. I get all of it. But this is sort of like trying to think from an organization's perspective here. Chris Getz feels very safe in knowing that Sal Perez is a catcher who can catch, kind of, and has a relationship with Pedro Grafol and has the pedigree that the White Sox are missing in the clubhouse that will help establish some sort of consistency. So that's what I'm banking on. If this does, if this rumor does come to fruition, that's how I'm justifying the move, Elijah. 
I hear you, Mike. Um, I, you made a lot of really good points, and I get it. I think there there is that need for clubhouse stability, and there's a need for people who can change that culture and build a professional setting, like you said. But at the same time, this could also end up with, like you said, Sal Perez loves Pedro Griffol. That could end up as, you know, that's Pedro's guy. That could create more, con- you know, confusing in the clubhouse. More people could be upset about this guy's got extra special treatment as, you know, this veteran, well-known all-star catcher or whatever. It just, I, I just, I hear you and I get it. I-, I think there is a need for leadership, but I'm just, I'm a fan of this new era that focuses on youth and then you add the veterans in the margins. And I know that, the White Sox didn't do enough to fill those gaps when they had this young core coming up a few years ago. But it's hard for me to justify adding players purely for the sake of culture. The culture should come from within, and the culture should come from the... I mean, yes, you need veteran players, but you need the culture to be established by your general manager and Chris Getz and your manager and Pedro Grafal and your hitting coaches and your pitching coaches and the entire staff and all of that needs to hone in on that culture and players need to just fall in line with it. And there's, if players aren't, they need to go, but it doesn't mean you just fill gaps with players who aren't good and aren't going to help the future. No, I hear present. you. So you it's, know, let, it's, me, it's, let me, let me, let yeah, me interrupt you real I, no, quick no, here, Elijah. It, it's now I understand where you're coming from when it, when you say purely cultural ad, I know, I know what you mean, but it's not it, it, because Sal is a catcher who will fill a lot of those games that the White Sox need to be filled. And then the second point is the clubhouse currently is filled with players under contract, you know, arbitration, pre-arbitration. It, the players that the White Sox are committing to, even those like Aloy Jimenez and, and Yohan Moncada, they signed longer-term deals. These guys are around, so you can't necessarily just move on from them. Now, I do agree with you 100% that it is on the players to be accountable. They have to stay, it's on them to adapt to major league professionalism. And also, I agree with you that the coaching staff has something to do with implementing that plan and getting it through to the player's right. head. At the end of the day, it, it, the players need to be accountable, but I just take exception to the fact that it's no, just I, a purely cultural ad. It, you know, yeah. There is some value in adding a position of need alongside Whit Merrifield, but, who kind of fits yeah. what Chris Getz is saying about athleticism, multiple positions, ball and sure. play type players. Go ahead. No, I, I, I get it. I, I hear you on that. But I think in my eyes, I would way rather add Victor Carantini for a fifth of the price of Sal Perez, sure. who can also yeah. be a catcher. And, and it's also like Sal Perez is barely a catcher. Let's be real. I, I, I no, don't mean right. to be rude at all, but the guy is one of the worst defensive catchers in baseball. He's not even an upgrade over Yasmani Grandal behind the plate, frankly. And this is somebody who we don't, it, he's a, he's a catcher DH platoon at this point in his career. And we have Eloy Jimenez for the foreseeable future, at least who's already set in as the everyday DH because we know he can't play the field consistently. So this is, this is an ad that I, I don't, I just, I can't see how it really helps on the field. And if it helps a ton in the cold, in the clubhouse and a little bit on the field, sure, whatever, that's fine. It's just, there's just not much there. And I would way rather plug holes with affordable pieces. He's not affordable. He's in a, on a really expensive contract. And I don't see Kansas City taking, you know, the heavy majority of his contract in any sort of trade, right? So this is a, this is a guy who's an expensive part-time catcher at this point in his career. Uh, that's the reality, who is not the hitter he once was. I know he had a huge 47 home run season or whatever a few years ago, but this is this he's past the peak of his career. He can't catch very well behind the plate. And ultimately there's a lot of other backup catchers out there that would be fine. And and the White Sox are hoping Edgar Caro is the everyday catcher in 2025, I think. And that's just like, so what what does a year of Sal Perez really do for you? Or even two years if he's the the platoon in 2025? It just mm-hmm. I, I just don't see it. I think Merrifield I can get on board with a little more. I like the positional versatility. I think having a guy that could you could play some right field for us. He could play some second base for us. Those are positions of need. He can back up other positions that need it. I mean, that's that's a piece I'm fine with. I think Merrifield would come a lot cheaper than Perez as well. Um, so if that's the option, I'm okay with that. I just I don't get the Perez thing. I don't like it. I don't see how it impacts the future. And I just I ultimately think that these ads we make right now need to be looking towards the future. And if you're adding a guy not for the future and for the short term to make the culture better and to fill a position of need, those types of ads should be smaller money, a little bit less of a name and just, and go to work and see what they can do. And if you get a guy, you can flip at the deadline or you can keep for two years and they're solid veteran piece for us, then sure. But Sal Perez is an expensive big name player Mm -hmm. that doesn't ultimately help in my eyes. 
So it's a matter of, okay, so we're taking, if I'm the White Sox, we're taking 24 and 25 as we got to figure this out. Yeah. And it's really hard to invest in free agency thinking past two years, right? right? And I think that's where the White Sox are sitting right now is they can afford to dump bad money on a player now because when they're ready to compete, that's when you need the budget flexibility and to make smart free agent signings that will invest in long-term success. So um, I, I hear you, Elijah. I, I don't like Sal Perez as a player now. However, if the White Sox know more than we do outside, because I know they know about the peripherals and all that, but if there's more to the signing than just having a capable or less than capable guy fill a position that they sure. absolutely need to fill at, Look, then it's their team. We're just fans of it. And the frustration, I totally empathize completely because the White Sox have essentially just kind of poo pooed. They're like, they're taking their hand and patting us on the top, top of the head and say, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. No problem. And then they go back to their front office and laugh because the, the pathway from 16 to today is so sad. And yet the, the feelings continue to compile. And it's just, yeah. uh, it's frustrating for White Sox fans. That's the reality, and it's tricky. And I I choose to focus on the farm system and the future, and we do that on this podcast. And for me, that is the way to look at this. And in the modern era of baseball, youth is the youth is the movement. I mean, I know that's just such a cliche thing to say, but like, look at Arizona right now. The Arizona Diamondbacks won 84 games, and they're in the NLCS with a legitimate chance to make the World Series. No, you're right. With you're a right. roster led by – you know, 22 year old, 20 just turned 23 year old Corbin Carroll. And, you know, Absolutely. their catcher who's 20, Gabby Moreno's 23. I mean, it's just their, their roster is just nothing but young talent. And they filled the gaps where they needed with a Tommy Pham at the deadline and with a Paul Seawald to back up their bullpen a little bit at the deadline, right? But those aren't the key pieces of their roster. The key pieces right. of their roster are these young players. And I know that's what the White Sox went for and it didn't work. But I'd rather try that again than waste our time on a lot of veterans that aren't going to help the future. I'd well, rather focus think, on you know the next wave, right? I think they are trying to get there. It's just yeah. I and mean, we've been talking about this yeah, on the podcast. Sure. You know, the, the White Sox are trying to get to that spot where they can fill the lineup their their primary core as cost controlled players that they drafted and developed themselves. I I think when you look at our top thirty and look at the number of names that are close to the big league ready, it, it's few and far between. You know what I mean? There are some prospects that are close, and we're looking for debuts in twenty twenty four for a number of them. I I still think there's a couple of years left in development. Although the way that Kansas City won, same with how Arizona's winning today, it's building from within and promoting from within. Yep. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. And I'm with you. It's just now when they're not trying yeah. to compete, I don't mind them flinging money around to a guy that they feel like can bring about positive change in an area that isn't quantitative. We know it. And yeah. but, I mean, but it's clearly a disaster because you got to be competitive. You got to show up, man. You got to go out into the field and play baseball like you think you can play baseball. Like show me that you want to play baseball. We talked about this before. So the, let's let's move on because we do want to talk about 2022 draft picks that have had really good seasons and that could be on the radar moving forward. Like this does apply to what we're talking about, but it also kind of reinforces the idea that the White Sox over the last two draft classes are bringing about interest in the talent that they have. However, still a little bit away and it's highlighted by Noah Schultz, Elijah. And this is a player that when he was drafted, we were taken aback. At least I was, I wasn't expecting the White Sox to go prep, especially the profile long-legged, fireballing, left-handed pitcher who projects to be a starter, uh, season cut short because of a shoulder impingement. Uh, we know the ceiling for Noah Schultz. What do you believe is the goal for 2024 in Noah Schultz season? I think it just it's just innings, right? I don't think there's nothing we saw on the mound that makes us concerned about Noah Schultz as a pitcher. Noah Schultz as a pitcher looks like he could legitimately be an ace of a staff one day. His stuff is excellent. The slider's great. He's really developed, you know, both the four-seam, two-seam combination with his fastball. And for a lanky guy, you know, he's, his velo is just going to keep growing. It's already up there, and it, it, it could easily add a few more ticks as he continues to develop. 
And his slider is just one of the better pitches I've seen in the minor league system for the White Sox. So, I mean, on the mound, I really don't think there's a lot for Schultz. I think you, I mean, there, there, you can't look at the numbers and say anything other than he was great. I mean, he threw, he threw 10 games with a one three three ERA. So yes, you know, the, he only threw 27 innings, right? That's the concern, right? He was hurt early in the year. He was hurt later in the year. He, the injuries were the issue, but 38 strikeouts, with a eight with a 0.85 whip in you know in his 27 innings pitch, the guy was great when on the mound. He had one bad start pretty much in the entire season, where he you know I think he I think that was the only start all his whole 10 starts he gave up or an earned run at all was when he gave up four earned runs in a start in July. And I think yeah, otherwise he didn't give up a single earned run the entire time. You know he was he was throwing this season in his 10 games he pitched in. So it's really just innings. I think if you can go into the season healthy and you can get Noah Schultz, you know, 80 to a hundred innings, I'm not going to say he needs to throw, you know, 140 like some of the other pitching prospects did this past year in the White Sox system. If you can get him 75 plus innings, I think you're in a really good spot going forward with him. And this is a guy who the, the mound it, it's, I'm not worried about that. I mean, there's going to be adjustments along the way as he continues to, you know, he's only pitched in Kannapolis. So as he continues to rise to the ranks, there'll be some pitching adjustments he'll have to make to, to kind of, he's, he's continuing to work on the changeup. I think that's one aspect that could really take him to another level as well. But ultimately, you know, he's 20 years old. He will go into next season still being 20. His birthday's in August, so he won't even be 21 until late next year. Um, and this is a guy who I think, you know, was, is the best pitching prospect in the White Sox system if he's healthy and on the mound. So it's really just going to come down to getting him on the mound, getting him innings, and continuing to, to really hone in on all of this raw talent he has. Because, I mean, this is... There's an argument to be made. He's mm -hmm. the highest upside player in the entire organization right now, you know, from a minor league standpoint. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that 100 percent. And I'm eyeing 65 to 80 innings next yeah. year. If he gets to that point, I am throwing a party and I want to okay. see him through develop his change up a little bit more. Um, worked his two seam fastball a lot. Slider really good. Um, if he throws that third pitch, then he's on his way. And like Elijah said, still very young. All right. Peyton Paulette. Miss 2022 due to Tommy John surgery, returned into form in 2023 and pitched at Low A Kannapolis full season for his first professional season uh, and pitched throughout the year. 22 starts, ended with a 4-1-3 ERA. I, look, take ERA how you want. I think it's an impressive number, but 22 starts, 72 innings pitch, and the walk rate is really the only thing that jumped out to me. But the fact that Peyton Paulette had this amount of success consistently throughout his first full professional season after Tommy John surgery has me very excited. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. Uh, like we just said with Schultz, I mean, this is another guy where it's the, the White Sox went risky. They took two pitchers with a lot of upside in the first two rounds last year. And both guys that had some injury issues, the the risk is inherent with Schultz. And we knew Paulette was going to be going through Tommy John recovery and everything. Uh, but this is another guy that just, it comes down to innings, right? And like we just said, our goal, the goal, I said the goal would be 75 innings for, for Schultz next year, right? And that's in his second full season after being hurt a lot of this year, Paulette got 72 innings in his first full year, especially coming off Tommy John. That is a, in itself, throwing 72 innings this year was a huge success for him. And he had some really impressive showings, right? Like he wasn't amazing. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't perfect. And like you said, the walk rate is a little bit concerning, but this is a guy who's, you know, 22 years old, was drafted at 21 years old out of college, right? And he's already, you know, shown a lot of promise in his first year off of Tommy John where he, you know, is is 72 full innings is, is really impressive. So honestly, for him, the fact that he was able to get those innings under his belt, look good at many different times, you know, he his stuff was working well for a lot of the time. He had some really impressive showings. Um, you know, he wasn't getting crushed. I think he didn't really have a start that was like a blow up necessarily. I'm looking at his numbers right now. The most he gave up in a start was four earned runs this year. So he wasn't getting crushed at all. He gave up a run or two in most of his starts. And that was basically how his season went with a pretty good strikeout rate and a little bit too many mm -hmm. walks. But first season off Tommy John, this is a guy, another guy that I think can be a really solid pitcher. I don't think he has the upset of Schultz. But Paulette is another guy with a lot with serious rotation upside who got the innings he needed to get under his belt. If he can ramp up from, you know, 72 to 100 plus next year, this is a guy who could easily start to really, really see the the results on the field even more as he gets more comfortable, gets in his routine. I, I can see him going, you know, 100 innings with a 3-5 ERA next year pretty, pretty easily. I can see that. 
Yeah, at the next level, too. I mean, when you exactly. talked about low A, it's very impressive to see he's got a full repertoire and he's one of those guys with the ceiling of like a two, three, four rotation piece. I would say I don't I don't want to yeah. give him a status quite yet because, exactly. you know, compared to Noah Schultz, I mean, there's kind of a gap there in yeah. terms of his stuff, but he is putting it together and he's got the frame, the delivery, and he's adding the innings already. So it's a great first season for Peyton Paulette. Let's move on to Jordan Sprinkle, Elijah, because a player like this is of value to any organization because he plays shortstop and he's very athletic. However, it's the bat that we're eyeing to look for improvement. Yeah, this is this is my guy. I watched uh, I watched Sprinkle when he was in college a lot, and you know he is someone who he started the year pretty rough, and the bat, like you mentioned, is kind of the the point where you need to see some progression from him. Um, but you know he is a whiz with the glove. He's incredibly athletic. His speed is there, so this is you know you're already getting those tools that are pretty much guaranteed with a glove guy, a guy that can really pick it at shortstop would be great at second base too if that's the long term position for him. So you know defensively, he he's an infielder, he's a middle infielder, he's really strong there. He's got plus speed. He could steal some bags. That's kind of you know another facet of his game that's that's worth watching. And it really just comes down to how much he can hit. You know the swing and miss was a little high early in the season. He was really struggling. Ended up going on the IL um, middle of the year and then looked better when he came back. He looked he looked solid and he returned at the very end of July from the IL and you know through all of August he slashed two seventy four three fifty four four eleven. So not eye popping numbers, right? But a you know a seven sixty five OPS for a guy that has an elite glove upside with the base on the bases. You know, good good speed, natural ability. The the strikeouts are are high. They need to come down a little bit. He needs to develop that approach a little bit. The walks need to come up. But generally speaking, a guy with some ability to hit it has shown it at times. I mean, when I when I had seen him in college, he had. A year, his his second to last year of college, he was one of the best college players in the country, um, and then had a had a rough year in his last season of college, a little bit regressing a little bit of that, trying to do a little bit too much at times. It felt like to me, but I think this is a guy who has still has upside with the bat and with that high four from his glove and his athleticism is someone that's worth watching. And you know, it's a fourth round pick. This is the White Sox invested a lot in Sprinkle, and I think he is someone that they are going to take their time with. But I also think that it, it really just is a matter of that bat developing a little more consistency, toning into his pop a little bit more, um, just continuing to work on becoming, you know, an above average hitter because with the glove, he's already got that stable floor of an infielder that can be really consistent. If he can get to a 700 OPS, I'll be very excited because yeah. uh, maybe I don't want to say very excited. I don't want, you know, but just in reference to where he is in his professional career at the plate. Uh, he's still walking like he's getting on base. It's just, he's having trouble making contact and, you know, maybe Babbitt has something to do with it, but man, if he's able to just get a few more hits and maintain a walk rate, then suddenly you got something that you can build on uh, more than what you already have as a defensive specialist. Right. And when we talk about players who we're trying to figure out a pathway for them to get to the major leagues, if Jordan Sprinkle can be that utility player who can, at least handle his own at the plate, then there's room for you on a big league roster because of how athletic he is. And there, there's something there. And we want to continue to monitor Jordan Sprinkle. And talking about pathways to the big leagues, it's different for relief pitchers, Elijah. We talk about the way that starters have to sell it to us that they can handle becoming starters before they even move to the next level in their organization. Uh, for relievers, Eric Adler is somebody who could leap levels quickly because of his stuff and the way that relievers work eric adler is somebody similar he reminds me a little bit of jordan leisure in terms of just electric stuff honing in and then you got your way uh to the big leagues if you're just able to kind of compartmentalize the ineffectiveness when it comes to your pitch mix yeah and one thing that was really impressive about adler like you said in terms of jumping levels right he has experience at wake forest right so that's a big time school he's played a lot of high competition levels he breezed his way through Kannapolis, and then he looked even better in Winston Salem this year. So he got the, you know, he got the bump to Winston midseason, and he actually was went from a three one eight ERA in Kannapolis through twelve games to a two seven zero in Winston through sixteen games to round out the season. So this is somebody who the White Sox they used him in some save situations, they used him late inning, you know, eight setup situations, right? So 
as a you don't you don't often hear about that many relievers that are you know in the prospect rankings per se because a lot of the relievers end up being you know guys who are starters that move to reliever to try and figure things out. But Adler is is being looked at as a reliever. He's being developed that way, and he looks really good. So I think this is someone that a little bit of command wavering at times. Eighteen walks across thirty one and a third innings is a little much, but I think generally speaking, the stuff is there. The composure is there, um, and he's somebody that at 23 years old, right? I expect him to, to get up to Birmingham next year. Who knows? Maybe even Charlotte if things click. The relievers that succeed definitely move quickly, like you said. Um, I think Adler is somebody that we could we could look forward to being on a 2025 White Sox candidate, like many of these other guys we've discussed. And let's keep it to the relievers quickly, because somebody that I think all of us were sleeping on was Tristan Stevers, and. The, the frame is what jumps out to me, Elijah, right away. 6'4", 220, um, older, and he held his own throughout a year where he ended in Birmingham at 24 yeah. years old, somebody who didn't give up a homer like throughout his entire season, and I believe he led the way. Maybe he was, uh, he was among the better pitchers in Winston-Salem before – uh, in the entire advanced day class, I should say, before Definitely. getting promoted to double A. So, I mean, what do you got on uh, Tristan Stevers? Yeah, Stevers is great. Uh, first of all, for everybody excited, look out for an interview with Tristan Stevers coming soon. I'm talking with him uh, in the near future. So we'll have in our prospect interview series, we will have Stevers on the show um, in the near future. So you can get to hear way more about what we're going to touch on here from him directly about all, all this type of stuff. But, you know, great stuff. 56 strikeouts, um, 38 in the third innings in his first professional season. So he got a lot of work in um, with the majority of that coming in Winston, continued the success in Birmingham, the just generally really good stuff limits the hard contact. Like you said, didn't have a single home run. So this is a guy who, you know, as a, as a late round, very late round 16th round pick, right. The, the expectation isn't super high there, but I think the white Sox, he, he was, he played a lot in college. He's already he's 25 now, right. Like you mentioned. So this is a guy who they're not going to be afraid to move him quickly. And I think Stevers, there's, there's a world where Stevers debuts next year, frankly, because if you're succeeding as a relief pitcher already in double a and you, you know, or at his current age, like there's really no reason to not keep keep letting him work and keep letting him go. So I think like all these young pitchers, the command is a little bit shaky at times, but you know, he was a closer in, in Winston Salem at times. He even closed a game at the end of the year in Birmingham. So this is someone who I expect to be a piece really soon. And because of his age and because of how much he showed this year, there's really no reason not to keep fast tracking him to the big leagues. Um, and we're, I'm excited to, I'm really excited to talk to him and talk about kind of just his game with him in, in the future. There it is. We're breaking it down on Future Sox. Every week, we release the Future Sox Roundup on Fridays, the Future Sox podcast on Tuesdays, and Elijah has one-on-one interviews with White Sox prospects that we drop on Mondays. We really appreciate your support. Go to futuresox.com for all the information that we have. We're covering the Arizona Fall League, and we're also done with our affiliate reviews. So if you didn't read them yet, make sure you go to the site and check them out because we covered single A, double A, triple a and the dominican summer league so we really appreciate the support we do it for you we love the white Sox, even though it's really hard to sometimes you know what i'm saying for elijah evans my name is mike rankin you can follow us on twitter at rankin 906 and at elijah ev8 and at future socks all one word thanks so much for tuning in we'll talk to you all next week